accepted for what you have for us, Lord. Just thank you, Father, for this life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, before we get into more of uh, this writing, uh, maybe I know Kayla wasn't able to join for a couple weeks, and so I'll have you guys kind of do a little bit of a review, and that can be, you know, in in um, maybe some things that you observe that that. Uh, really stood out to you in terms of new truths or real truth in relation to whether that be what I taught or what you read or maybe something that the Lord showed you while you were reading. And Kayla, if you have things that you'd like to mention as well, that's fine because I know that you've been reading. Um, so let's just take a few minutes to, to do that. And, you know, don't, don't make me call on you. Just kind of jump in and share what you'd like to share there and uh you know then i'll try and fill in the gaps so everybody's looking at their notes <laughs> speak up so that the folks on the other side can hear you can you guys hear Naomi okay? Anyway, go ahead. Speak up. There's a lot of, or based on our relationship between you and Naomi, and um, we did, well, the first week we did a lot of, of an introduction to the book. With this translation? The translation, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's more of an uh, explanation of this book. Um, and let's see, some of the stuff I've written down, one of the main things I've written down um, that stood out to me was uh, something that uh, God did through this writing is show his, his, I have written down, intense longing to be, to be with, a complete relationship or a never fading attraction. Hmm. Okay. Uh, between uh, <coughs> lovers, I guess. He and his people. Yeah, he and his people. Um, and then I also have written down how similar the Lord expressed his deep love for his people through this writing. Um, hmm. And his love, his plan, and his purpose for us, uh, and his true desire for us to uh, know him and how he wanted us to know that we were created in his own image and over all of, his, uh, of his living things. Mm -hmm. But we talk about, a lot about love too. Um, and then we also talked about um, how God made the woman out of the man. And that was like a representation Mm -hmm. He made the woman out of the man. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, so that's <laughs> Good points there. Who else? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Kayla. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a mystery there about the 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 bride and the brides. Um, you know the those are in the context of the, the the marriage ceremony and relationship. You have those who help the bride to be prepared for the groom and for the coming of the groom. And so in that sense. It's not necessarily that we would look at the, the brides-to-be 
or the way that they're described here, the brides to be, was that would would be that they also would be brides, but the real the separation that's there is in their service to making the bride ready. So that may not be directly in the spiritual sense, directly related to another group of people so much as it is it is and it's not. They're still part of the bride, brides to be, but in this sense that would be the appointments and the the ordained giftings that God gives to uh, within within the body of Christ to equip and prepare. So that was the that was the role of the bridesmaid is to help her adorn herself and help her beautify herself. And if you think about that in the context of the New Testament and you know the writings of Paul and the things that he said, God gave these gifts in order that they would do this, which was what bring the bride, the people of God, to the the likeness of Christ, to the full stature of Christ. So does that make sense in terms of their role and why there's a separation between them? Good. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> So there's a commitment that's there, and you know that's one thing that we we did discuss over the last <coughs> couple of weeks was that really the writing here is it does definitely portray some of the love and commitment between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, but in re in in the greater context of the writing, this writing is about the purpose of God and his passion for the fulfillment of his creative purpose toward man in, in a relational fulfillment. And so even the later apostles describe this joining together of man and woman as a great mystery, okay? So that means that the relationship of marriage or the covenant of marriage is something that is meant to mean more than what it does in the earthly realm between a man and a woman. So even Jesus said to the Pharisees that in eternity and in the heavenly realm, there is no marriage or being given to marriage. And so what he was talking about in that context was a lack of understanding that the religious leaders of the time had about spiritual relationships and spiritual identities. And so this long song poem that is written is using allegory. So it's illustrating, it's using the relationship between a man and a, and a woman, specifically in relation to marriage and the intimacy of that relationship to create or to give us an idea that we can relate to because of earthly relationships of something that is represented, uh, something greater that is represented in the heavenly realm, which is why Paul says this is such a mystery. And I think a lot of that mystery is tied into the things, it, Naomi touched on it as well, and we spent a lot of time last week talking about it actually, was the purpose of God in creating one like himself and then using that same pattern when 
after he had created Adam in his own image, to then create out of Adam one like him, out of man. Is what Out of Adam is what woman means, out of man. And so then he says that the two will become one flesh. And so the, the end desire of God's intention in creation man was that he would become like him and we're going to see some nuances of this in the next few chapters that this is the that when we see the language of the the bride or the groom or the what it, how is he described here he's described as the shepherd king or also as the um well primarily as the shepherd king okay and or he's also described in chapter four as the bridegroom king okay when we when we when he when the, we, we read the language in this writing about his desire to come into an intimate place with her and then her the, the the bride's response being come into my garden your garden and it, and it's talking about this inner place then we have all these very interesting poetic nuances and references to the desired relationship that God wanted to have with man, Adam and Eve, in the garden. But it's expressed through this relational, this relationship, rather than as a direct reference to, you know, obviously Solomon didn't, didn't come out in this writing and say, quote unquote, God's purpose is this. Because to define God's purpose in such a straightforward matter of fact way would not it would for 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 our own understanding and the understanding of what is in the heart of and desire deepest desires of the human heart which is to be connected in relationship to be known and to know is the greatest fulfillment that of of the greatest longing of the human soul uh, you know, others have in the past have described this in reference to, you know, the, the gospel of salvation, saying that God created man with a vacuum inside him that only God himself can fill. And that, you know, somehow being directly correlated to our salvation so that we don't, you know, endure internal punishment, but rather we endure eternal bliss in heaven. But there's something more than that, because. We never, in that same uh, thought, there was never much consideration, or at least in my hearing, not much explanation given as to what that vacuum, that, sh that missing part in man really is and how it's really fulfilled. The fulfillment is not, way I get to go to heaven, or I don't, I don't have to go to hell and be punished. The fulfillment is, is the very thing that God desired before he created, created, which was, I want to have one like me. And so when Adam was laid down and put to sleep so that God could out of him create Eve, and then when they were brought back, when Adam woke and Eve was there, then the fulfillment was, wow, there is someone that's like me. And we saw that what God was showing Adam through the naming of the animals and bringing them all before him. Yes, he gave them a name and he, he acted as, as a, uh, in a ruling sense in that way. But what he was also seeing is, well, that, that's, that giraffe isn't much like me. You know, this this alligator is a, a magnificent creature, but I have nothing in common with it. You know, this beast of the field is beautiful, but I can't communicate with it. I can't fellowship with it. I, I have no, I have no likeness with it. And when he saw woman, he said, "That's like me." And God, that, that, um, the depth of knowledge and fellowship that could, that the potential that was there because of that likeness was 
something very unique and special and something that God would have us see and understand about how he created us and what he created us for. So all in all, my hope is that after we've spent some time studying this scripture, that we don't see it as a simple allegory of, you know, quote unquote, a relationship between a man and a woman and what it should or should not be like. But that we see the depths of God's heart and his desire to have fellowship with one like himself. That's the key because that and the, the, the amazing thing is that God did not do that uh, in, in only one. But his purpose was that it would be that he would have a whole family with which to have this deep and intimate fellowship. And I want us to see the, the passionate and intimate language that is written in this writing of, in that perspective, because that's the, the real message and of this beautiful, most beautiful of all song. So any, who else wants to share something? Yeah, well, sorry. I did want to have a, a bit of a review there, but I don't want to keep you guys from being able to share or mention anything else that's on your heart or that maybe you have a, a different way of expressing the things that I just said as well. So, S, anything? Not really anything else that comes to mind. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, it shocked him to have someone like him mm -hmm. that came from him because he didn't have an extra one. He already had a bunch of great ones. Right. Yeah, true. And so there's a there's a bit of a a mystery there in I think also even in relation to the piercing of the the side of Christ um, on the cross. Uh, but we won't dive into that that too much. But it, it, we know that for sure it cost Jesus his own life. He had to lay down his life. Well, let's continue. Last uh, last week we kind of made it through uh, part of. Uh, oh, sorry, Elaine or Emmanuel. Do do you guys have anything that you'd like to share before we move on? I just wanted to say hello to everybody and tell you we are by us. So, Kila, good to have you, to keep, to, to have you around. So I don't see you yet, but uh, welcome to Washington. <laughs> How about you, Elaine? I don't think I have anything else to add. No worries. So last last session, we, uh, as mentioned, we made through, you know, uh, about halfway through um, the first chapter. So I just want to look at some highlights. Um, I mean, the book's short enough where it's almost wonderful to read, but it is it's it's a little repetitive in uh, in theme, uh, as we mentioned uh, in the introduction. But I think we made it through maybe verse six or seven. Um, so let's look at this latter, latter part of chapter one, um, starting in verse eight, <coughs> and this is the shepherd king speaking. And he says, listen, my radiant one, of course, speaking to the bride, if you ever lose sight of me, just follow in my footsteps where I lead my lovers. Come with your burdens and cares, come to the place near the sanctuary of my shepherds, excuse me. So the, the, the first, right in the middle of the verse there, he says, if you ever lose sight of me, 
follow in the footsteps where I lead my lovers. So again, let's not let's take this for a moment out of the the it, not the context, but out of the uh, you know a more closed idea in our mind that just pictures a man and a woman and their desire for one another. And let's let's look at this in relationship to the believer and their walk with the Lord. And, you know, it's a uh, the, the path has been described as a narrow path, uh, as one that uh, not many tread upon and, and maybe as one that is a, a steep ascent to the mountain and upon the mountain of God. And here he says, if you lose sight of me, follow in the footsteps where I lead my lovers. What are those? And so this is really expression of a way of life. So, you know, there are moments and times in life where we may feel like we have lost direction. And by the loss of direction, I don't necessarily mean that um, we don't know what we should do you know, whether that be uh, for a job or place we should live or whatever else like that, I think that more in reference to what is the Lord's will for my life? And how is my life being directed in such a way so as to be in aligned with God's eternal purpose? Because God's purpose for our eternal, for our individual life is not going to uh, be run against the stream of what his eternal purpose is for mankind. Now, he may have a specific calling or grace to be given to one life or another, but it is all in fulfillment of his eternal purpose. And so the footsteps where he leads his lovers, this leading is, is in many ways like a reference to discipleship and specifically the discipling or teaching and leading into a particular way of life. Okay? So then the message here would be when you feel like you're losing sight, you know, you need to take observation of your way of life, the way that you make decisions and, and the way that you handle relationships and remember how you were led to do so. And maybe sometimes we need to be we need to consider, are we being led? Are we being led by our own desires? Are we being led by others? Or are we being led by the eternal purpose of God and by his spirit? And so in that, he also makes reference to um, coming to release your burdens. So this is, he says, come to the place near the sanctuary of my shepherds. And that to me is very reminiscent of Jesus himself speaking and saying, come unto me, all of you who are heavy laden, lay down your burdens, take up my, my yoke, for it is easy, my burden is light. So he continues talking about how beautiful the bride is, and then down in verse 11 he says this, Again, the shepherd king speaking. He says, we will enhance your beauty. Encircling you with our golden reins of love, you will be marked with our redeeming grace. So a lot of what we'll do as we go through the chapters is just look at the imagery or consider what this imagery is implying, okay? So he says, we will make, we will enhance your beauty. Well, this is a direct reference to the beautification, and this is obvious enough, <clears throat> the beautification, the nurturing of, and the maturing of the bride, even the purification of the bride. So Kayla, you mentioned the, the function or the, the, the presence of the bridesmaids, the brides-to-be, what was their purpose, and that's what I was talking about, to to make the bride ready. And God, Jesus said that through the spirit that he would give what is needed to make the bride pure. And there in the New Testament, through the writings of the apostles, we can see that there is a specific way that that is done. 
through the order and relationship of discipleship, by the grace given by God, through the, I guess, what they've been called in the past is the administrative gifts. Uh, you know, unfortunately, in this day and time, those have been made to be, you know, positions and or offices within the fellowship of believers or, you know, an institutional church system or otherwise. But really, they are the grace given by God to enable these very things, the purification, beautification, nurturing and building up, maturing of the bride so that she may come to be fully prepared for her groom and for the unity that she and the groom will have as one. And that's why Paul finishes some of his statements by saying to the full stature of Christ, that we may be one with him. The last verse or the last words of verse 11 are you will be marked with our redeeming grace. For some reason, that reminded me of the statement that is to be placed. It was placed both on the on the on the garments of the priest, on the head of the priest. And we see it in the imagery uh, that is given in the book of Revelation in relation to the bride, which is that she is and that the people of God are to be holy unto the Lord, marked, set apart. And how are they done so? Not because of their own efforts, not because of their own uh, works or uh, righteousness or knowledge, but by the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ, who is the one that is referred to as the shepherd king. Continuing on, the Shulamite responds in verse 12, as the king surrounded me at his table, the sweet fragrance of my praise perfume awakened the night. Now, I remember at one point we were talking about the name, the meaning of the name Judah, which is praise, and then take an observation of the life of Judah uh, through, uh, if you remember, Judah was the older brother of Joseph, who was the younger brother that was sent into slavery in Egypt and then, you know, was in Pharaoh's dungeon. And then ultimately Judah's life had to come into full submission to God's order. And it was not until Judah's life and pride and, and his stature in life had been fully humbled, humiliated, broken, that he can then truly offer uh, the praise. And so his life, it wasn't just his words, but his life. So we see here, this perfume, this praise perfume, is the fragrance of a life relinquished toward or for another. And we see a similar, there's a similar imagery of that with, the, with Mary who came and broke the alabaster box to pour the perfume over Jesus' feet. Not only in preparation for his death and burial, but also as a representation of this very similar principle um, in the giving of life. Verse 13 says, A sachet of myrrh is my lover, like a tied-up bundle of myrrh resting over my heart. In reference to the, the a, a reference to a picture of the cross. And myrrh was an embalming spice. It was always and ever associated with suffering. And we know that Jesus' death and it was certainly a sweet fragrance to God. And I find the rest of that uh, verse interesting. It says, he, this being the shepherd king, is like a bouquet of henna blossoms, henna plucked near the vines at the fountain of the lamb. I will, hold, I will hold him and never, uh, why, is, why has he become so pleasing to her? So if you notice the footnote uh, A below, in reference to the original translation, it's you know, the, the fountain of Engedi, which means fountain of the lamb. And the henna is a homonym that can mean atonement or redeeming grace. So he has become... The bridegroom king has become so pleasing to her because he has become pleasing 
to the Father as a living sacrifice. Now we know that Jesus laid down his life in the flesh and that he also took it up. So, um, and then this chapter ends with um, the Shulamite speaking as well about finding her resting place. Basically resting in his rest. And that is the, if we could see the references that are made both from and to, so from the former writings of the Torah <laughs> and the travails and travels and the journey of the Israelites up until this point. So I think it would be beneficial, <coughs> excuse me, as you continue to read in the, and study the scriptures, Throughout your life, when you read the Torah, the first five books, and some of the prophets, and take observation of the life of his of the life of the Israelites, Naomi, do you think you could get me a glass of water? Um, and then also when you read the New Testament, Jesus' own words and the apostles' writings, and you see that there are that Solomon, when he was writing this, was poetically referring to the journeys of Israel and their relationship with God. And then we also see the New Testament authors and characters, Jesus included, who have obviously read this writing, understand its poetic references, and even while they're not quoting, it's not like Paul or Jesus comes out and says, and like Song of Solomon, Chapter 2, verse 3 says, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they sometimes do make specific re references um, to the prophets of old, but not always. Most of the time they were quoting, when they did make reference to scripture, they did so in such a way that it was still living and active. No, I think she needs something to drop it. So anyway. This resting place, I, I was pre-qualifying this statement, this rest, resting place, the, the, to come to find rest in his rest is the, the same rest, okay, that God had after creation, that God was calling his people into, that they would not enter into, into it. Paul made reference to that. You might need to unlock the office. Paul made reference to that in Hebrews saying that when God became angry with Israel because of the rebellion and disobedience and unbelief, that he would not allow them to enter his rest. And so the encouragement of the author there is that we don't miss entering into that rest. And through the poetic imagery of this song, we can see that it is very much God's desire for those who were created like him to not only be co-labors co with him, suitable helpers in his work and his design and creation, but also to take rest in his rest. So again, you can see this is not a simple reference to uh, 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 a man and a woman or hu a husband and wife to be that have been apart. And now they're together and they think, well, let's go relax on the couch for a while and take a rest. There's much more to it than that. It, there's much more than just those two individuals saying, ah, it's so wonderful to take a break and be together. These are everything in this writing is a reference to the grandeur of the spiritual relationship that God desires to have with his people. Chapter 2, verse 1, I am truly his rose, the rose of Sharon, the very theme of his song. What an amazing thing to say in the midst of the song of all songs. The Shulamite says to the shepherd king, I am the theme of his song. Now that, this touches on our reference to this song being a beautiful poetic expression of God's eternal purpose 
in creation. And who and or what is the theme of his song? Well, we know that Adam and Eve were created as the crown of creation. The, the prophets referred to that. The, the New Testament and apostles referred to that. And so we see, and this is what I've you know been mentioning all along, that this is God's purpose. The very theme, theme and purpose are very closely related here in this sense. Everything that God did, he did to make way for this relationship with his people. And in Genesis, that the creation account is abundantly clear that God in, in the way that the creation account was not just written, but in the way that God actually did what he did, was so that his purpose in doing what he did would be manifest. He made that abundantly clear. I am overshadowed by his love growing in the valley, she says. And then the shepherd king responds, yes, you are my darling companion and I wrote down a reference to Genesis chapter 2 18 where the Lord says and, and if this is something that we looked at last week but let's go ahead and reiterate it the shepherd king is looking at his bride to be in this way so, again, not focusing on the nuances of a relationship be between husband and wife so much as the desire of God for his people created in his likeness, in his image. Okay. Verse 18 in chapter 2 of Genesis, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then, of course, 22 says, And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. So we see this companionship is not just two people who enjoy each other, but those who fulfill together. God's purposes, and that is his purpose for the bride and with the relationship between the bride and his son, Jesus, who are to become as one to him. So let's move a little further on in chapter 2. Another reference uh, to the brides to be, like Kayla mentioned earlier, this is in verse seven of chapter two. Promise me brides to be by the gentle gazelles and delicate deer that you'll not disturb my love until she is ready to arise. Now that's an interesting statement that's mentioned two or three times throughout this writing, not to stir it up until it's ready. <laughs> I I have a hard time trying to express how much is behind these writings. If the brides to be, those bridesmaids, those helpers of the bride, these gifts given by God, and it, these spiritual helpers that are to equip and enable and help purify the bride, but they are to be done in due time and in the right season. Okay? You know, much of the mindset of, of quote-unquote ministry or ministries in this day, knowing that God uses those things to prepare the bride may move into the place of assumption or presumption that they are able to themselves, by doing what they do, complete the work. But God is the one who, as Paul says, gives the growth. So in reference to God's use of his servants, Paul says, well, one plants the seed and 
One waters it, but God gives the growth. The growth is this mysterious power at work. We can observe it. We can even measure it in our observation, but we cannot make it happen. Jesus gave illustrations like that as well. The farmer's wisdom is that once he puts the seed in the ground, the process that takes place for that plant to grow, he has no control over. He, he can only observe it, and it will come in its due time. Not only the breaking forth of the seed out of ground, but also the growth of that plant unto the maturity, mature time that it can produce fruit. And again, that is to be done in the appropriate season. There are certain plants that if you plant out of season, they will not produce fruit. So this is a reference to the uh, a reference to, to spiritual growth and maturity in the timing of God, according to his will. And, and again, that reference is made um, uh, several times. Uh, later on down in this chapter, I'm just, I know this is kind of random and just kind of pointing out uh, some things that not only touch on the eternal purpose of God, but maybe expand our, our perspective on the meaning behind all the words that are written here. Back uh, or down in verse 11 or around verse 11, uh, 10 and 11, the, the, the king says, Arise, my dearest, hurry, my darling, come away with me. I have come as you have asked to draw you to my heart and to lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one. The season has changed. The bondage of your barren winter has ended. And the season of hiding is over and gone. The rains have soaked the earth. That's a very interesting statement to me. This is, is very much a prophetic utterance in relationship to a theme that we see all through the scriptures. And that is the theme of the barren woman. And that theme, has, that has even been a theme in the midst of our own people with dreams and visions for years now about the barrenness of the current state of the bride of Christ. Christianity as a whole has been in, been yet unable to produce the sons of God. But the scriptures tell us very clearly that the one who was barren, unable to bear child, and in sorrow, will bear a child. And that's a very interesting statement that the, the bridegroom king would make here. That's why I'm saying this is, it's a prophetic reference that is about the barren woman Coming to the place, well, she, she will no longer be barren. She will produce the fruit that God has so desired, the offspring of God, the sons of God. The season has changed, and the bondage of your barren winter has ended. ended. So there's also another reference to the seasons here, winter. That's what I was saying. If you plant during winter, you're not going to see fruit but in this reference we have the barrenness of winter coming to an end and the fruitfulness of spring along with the latter rains coming in that's the reference here the rains have soaked the earth and left it bright with blossoming flowers see we think that and science may tell us that the seasons are you know very specific things which they are but everything that god created has a greater expression in spiritual reality. And remember what the Apostle Paul tells us, which is that that which can be seen and observed is temporal, but that which is unseen is eternal. And so the, that which takes place in the spiritual and or heavenly realms is the true reality because it is where it is in the eternal realm. In verse 13, he makes another, another reference to this as well, saying, The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. This again, th there are many 
words spoken by the prophets of old and the prophets of the New Testament that make that, that this is a direct reference from and to. <laughs> so in other words, Solomon and his writing of this song was taking into account the words of the prophetic words of God, not only in the Torah, but through the prophets up to that point of time. And also looking forward, you know, by revelation to what would be. And then we see the same references made by Jesus and the apostles after that. So again, we're not saying that they were quoting from Song of Songs, but that the purpose of God, and that's one of my main emphasis here, that the purpose of God is not and has not been unknown or undeclared somehow. It is expressed in everything that God does. And that's why I'm really enjoying reading through this song because it's such a beautiful expression and culmination representation uh, poetic representation of God's eternal purpose we've, we've said it before I'll say it again poetry and the language poetic language is very expandable in other words uh, uh, you know a beautiful idea can be in our hearts and minds expanded to include a lifetime of understanding and activity. So chapter two ends, and it, there's kind of a regret here because the Shulamite says, you know, basically go ahead and go to the place that you need to go and I will come at another time. Somewhat of an interesting reference to you know, when Jesus Christ walked the earth physically and rose after his death and then ascended to heaven. So, and, and the people of God that was at the time of the, the birthing out of the church, but not yet the fulfillment of God's purpose for them to, to ascend to the high places with Christ. So let's look at that, uh, these ideas represented in, in these words. Verse 17, but until day, the day springs to life and the shifting shadows of fear disappear, turn around, my lover, and ascend. So that's the Shulamite speaking to the shepherd king and saying, you go ahead without me, basically. Turn around, my lover, and ascend to the holy mountains of separation without me, to the heavenly realms. Until the new day fully dawns. Now, it's so interesting. These words, new day, the dawning of the new day, the coming of a new day, the fullness of a new day, are all prophetic references to the fulfillment, the fulfillment of God's purpose. God's purpose was not fulfilled with the death, or death resurrection, and ascension of Christ because he was not meant to be one he was meant to be many, and the many is a direct reference to the unity between Christ and the people of God, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. So she says, run on ahead like the graceful gazelle and skip like the young stag over the mountains of separation. Go on ahead to the mountain of spices, the heavenly realm. I'll come away another time. So if we back up in this picture of this song and we can see, oh, wow, there's this is like a his, almost like a, a, a reference to the whole of history and the story that God has unfolded through the many generations of man. And we're very privileged in, in many ways to be able to look back on the history of God's people and God's uh, work in the midst of his people and also the declaration of his plan and purposes through the many generations of man as we have record of in scripture and testimony of by the Holy Spirit and through others. And that's what makes this song so beautiful. So we'll try and touch on a few things in chapter three and then close for the day. So right after she says, go ahead, 
then she immediately regrets in it, or, you know, there's a longing for the return of the groom, which is very much the travails of the church in this latter day for the last age, the age of the church. But with the turning of the age and the coming of the kingdom and the return of the king, you like that, Kayla? That was like reference to, you know, the restoration. <laughs> we, uh, in the restoration of all things, specifically that being God's purpose, we have this expression of the Shulamite, the bride, for the returning of her love, of the, bri of the groom. Night after night I'm tossing and turning on my bed of travail. Why did I let him go from me? How my heart now aches for him, but he is nowhere to be found. Now this aching and longing, just so you know, the mystery that's behind these things is the same groaning and moaning that all creation has for what? For the revelation or the manifestation of the sons of God, those who have become one in the life of Christ. And that is this greater fulfillment of God's purpose. Jesus Christ was not to be the only son. He was created as such, but he was sown into the earth. And his life was sown into the earth in such a way so that it may reproduce itself as many. The scriptures are very, very clear about that. So now we need to see this, this travailing that's being mentioned in this chapter as the same longing for fulfillment. And interestingly, there is a going to and fro and a searching here and there. So that's what's mentioned. He is nowhere to be found. So I must rise and search for him, looking through the city, seeking until I find him. What an interesting reference that she makes there uh, in the footnote there, A, about city. It says the city is a picture of the local church, a place with government, old order, and overseers. She goes from church to church looking for the one she serves. That's fascinating to me in light of the, the last, again, in reference to the church age and the developments of, you know, various theological understandings, beliefs, denominations, and all the confusion that has gone on in the church and the present day reality that many people go from one place to another looking for truth. But he is nowhere to be found, seeking until I find him. Where is this truth? Where is this way? That's very interesting, this reference to where we started back in chapter, uh, latter part of chapter 1. Um, and 1, uh, 8, where he says, listen, my radiant. This is, uh, I mean, look at the connection reference. So he has ascended, and now she's looking for him. Okay? Now back in chapter 1. The shepherd king had said, listen, my radiant one, if you ever lose sight of me, if you can't find me, if you don't see me, follow in my footsteps. Consider the way of life. Now, there, I, I don't remember the exact scriptural references, but the prophets very clearly said, turn back to the ancient paths. What is this way? What is this path that leads to the, to the high place of God. David asked, who may ascend the mountain of God? So here, the bride is in this place, and in many ways, stuck within the confines of the religious system, which has does not hold in its, it, it doesn't teach the way. It doesn't show the way. It has a form but no power. So she continues, even if I have to roam through every street, nothing will keep me from my search. Where is he? My soul's true love. He is nowhere to be found. Then I encountered the overseers as they encircled the city. So I asked them, coming to the leadership of the day for many generations, have you found him? My heart's true love. Obviously, they did not. 
No, dis- no true discipleship. But then verse 4. As I moved past them, then I encountered him. <laughs> As I moved beyond the earthly realm and order, beyond man's ways, beyond religion, then I encountered him. I found the one I adore. And I caught him and fastened myself to him. Refusing to be feeble in my heart again, now I'll bring him back to the temple within. Very interesting. See this imagery? Where I was given new birth. Where was she given new birth? Where does the new birth for the believer take place? Born from where? Born from above. So we see Jesus, here Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Unless you've been born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you've been born again, you cannot enter in. But she says, I'll bring him back to the temple within. So there's a renewal that takes place in the inner man. She's very, very particular about that. Where I was given new birth in the, the inner man, the heavenly realm, into my innermost parts, the place of my conceiving. Where do the poets, the psalm writers say that we were conceived? (laughs) In the heart and mind of God. And that conception is not just the looking forward to the coming of a life, but to the manifestation of God's purpose for that life. And in this case, for the people. So here we go again, the second reference to that the bridegroom came in verse 5. Wait for the right time. Wait for the right season. Wait for the right generation for these things to break forth, for the for the fullness to come, for this reality to be manifest. And then finishing chapter three. Verse 11 says, rise up, Zion maidens, brides to be. Come and feast your eyes on this king as he passes in procession on the way to his wedding. This is the day filled with overwhelming joy, the day of his great gladness, a very much a reference to the wedding feast of the Lamb, this coming day. So the the references here, the poetic references made throughout this writing are you're going to see they – I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this, but they they they, they cover the, the 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 expanse of God's purpose from beginning to end. Why he did it, why he began it, and what it will become, what the culmination is, what the fulfillment is. So we'll finish there today and you know, we'll see maybe we'll finish the study next week, but there's just so many beautiful things to note there. And I would encourage you to read and reread um, just because it's wonderful to read these things. <laughs> anyway, we'll finish there today. Elijah, you want to close us in prayer? Father, we love you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this meeting, Lord. I thank you for the book of Song of Songs. Lord, I pray that we would take this book, Lord, the more than man has tried to just portray it as, Lord, but see your true purpose inside it and what was really being written down. So, Lord, I pray that we would do this in all things, Lord, continue to seek out your true purpose in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would be honorable to you, Lord, that we would would truly follow your voice and your and your way, Lord, so I pray that you would draw each one of us closer to you. I pray this in your name. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Amen. I'm a little bit distracted this